Welcome back to Federal Insights, sponsored by Rancher Government Solutions here on Federal News Network. My guest today is Brandon Gulla, the Chief Technology Officer for Rancher Government Solutions, and I'm Tom Temin. And before the break, Brandon, we were talking briefly about Kubernetes, and this is seems to be the next generation of where this containerization is going, this way of getting beyond virtualization so that you can deploy flexibly throughout this three-tiered infrastructure we described earlier. Tell us more about that, how it works, where you get it, and what it does for you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tom. So Kubernetes itself is an orchestration framework uh, that's more of a collective ecosystem, and it's intended to host applications at scale reliably across any computing infrastructure. So uh, back in 2013, a technology came, uh, came to fruition called Docker. And Docker is kind of synonymous to the containerization world. It's the Kleenex, if you will, uh, of you know, the opportunity to isolate applications and ship them as centralized applications uh, in a modular, idempotent, immutable type of format. We've seen, you know, over the last decade, virtual machines ushered in a new paradigm shift when within the uh, computing world, allowing you to isolate all your dependencies in an operating system and ship it off, whether it's on a hard drive or a very fat file, and allow someone to turn it on just as if they snapshotted something in time. It was a great opportunity, but it's very bloated in the sense that oh, you just need Microsoft Word, we'll ship you an entire Windows. That's not something that works at scale. And most importantly, it doesn't enable the tactical battlefield because you can't push 80 gig of data down the wire effectively uh, you know, in a repeatable fashion. So Docker came to light, uh, for, or, yeah, Docker came to light and centralized that development around the actual application, creating that immutable framework. With Docker containers isolating the dependencies within the Docker container itself, there needed to be a way to orchestrate that, not just on one computer, but tens of computers, hundreds or even thousands in a reliable format. So Google actually started a project called Kubernetes back in, I believe, 2014 or 2015, that took what they learned from the Google Borg project and focused on reliable computing with containers. So baking in things like disaster, or, or excuse me, high availability, um, health checks, even disaster recovery when it comes to persistent volumes, allowing you to have data that can be reliably uh, written to and read from, from applications at scale. So it was a great way to, de to commoditize the uh, systems administration perspective and actually turn it from a thinking of every server as a pet and more like cattle. You know, that's something that's used a lot, you know, uh, in phrasing when it comes to computing these days, but it makes a lot of sense where you don't want individual servers. You don't want to be able to point to it and say, that's my Nginx server. I built that last month. Don't touch it. It's never going to work. If you touch it, it's great, right? If that server dies, your application dies. So you don't want to treat it like a pet. You want to treat it like cattle where you're commoditizing the server uh, perspective where it shouldn't matter if a rat goes down or a server goes down, the application framework should be resilient enough to allow your, uh, your application to scale up appropriately and have zero downtime. That's actually where the term rancher comes uh, from and rancher government solutions because we wanna focus on treating applications and servers like cattle and not nurtured pets that we need to constantly uh, you know, uh, manicure and take care of. We want to commoditize the computing experience. Kubernetes is a great way to do that. So Kubernetes itself is actually an open source framework that is in the community. It's actually owned now by the cloud compute or excuse me, cloud native computing foundation from the Linux foundation. So it's in a public trust, if you will, where it's not centralized to the needs of one organization or one company. It's a great community that's comprised of different special interest groups focused on the different facets of computing. So there's an entire ecosystem under security, under storage, under networking, under disaster recovery, multi-cluster. It's little fiefdoms within a larger community that really percolate up to be that word and platform that we know as Kubernetes. Kubernetes is not just one binary, it's a collection of open source tools working in harmony 
to produce a reliable computing framework. So we here at Rancher and Rancher Government Solutions, we have our own distributions of Kubernetes uh, to, to really highlight here. One is called K3S. And why it's called K3S is because Kubernetes is commonly uh, referred to or shortened as KATS, K8S, and the eight uh, stands for the eight letters in between the K and the S in Kubernetes, because it's a long, funny word to say, right? Well, we wanted to create a lightweight distribution, so we called it K3S. And K3S, unlike traditional uh, Kubernetes, can thrive in low computing environments and uh, comms disadvantaged environments. It only takes as little as a 50 megabyte statically compiled binary file to get going with Kubernetes, sure. where traditional Kubernetes takes gigs and gigs of files. That's very important when it comes to uh, the tactical edge and enabling comm system advantage environments. And our other distribution that I'll touch on briefly is called RKE2, formerly known as RKE government. And it's the only open source distribution that bakes in uh, security by default, enabling uh, FIPS 140-2 NIST certified mm -hmm. encryption modules into the free and open source project. We want to lower the barrier to security, no matter if you're running in a home lab, a weapon system, or a Raspberry Pi, we believe security is good for everyone. All right. So you've described an environment where applications are highly portable. They're spun up, they're spun down. They are deployed with their data in such a way using these technologies you've described under Kubernetes in a way that is super flexible and for the agencies. But it strikes me that to have any kind of efficiency and cost savings here, it's all got to be automated because you can't have someone sitting at a console orchestrating or trying to conduct this level of complexity at speed doesn't even seem possible without automation. So discuss the efficiency creating aspects of all of this. Efficiency up and down the stack, Tom, all, all the way from the actual system administrators, uh, you know, responsible for the servers to the developers themselves, not just in the creation of the software, but the maintenance from day two and beyond. So I will focus being that I've talked about the infrastructure piece a good, uh, a good bit here, on the developer experience. So we've seen the maturization of concepts like software factories and DevSecOps, both outside of the US government and within the US government. Um, with you know, the US Air Force being a big component and uh, champion of that type of model with uh, the level up software factories, of course, Platform One, which we're a big part of uh, with the US Air Force that focus on, focuses on repeatable software builds through automation and validation testing. So essentially, it shouldn't matter where a developer is writing code, they can push a code commit and it will rebuild, rescan, and re-implement those code changes all the way up, possibly directly into production. That is saving a huge amount of time and everyone knows time is money because you don't have to sit there and have a code review with every single code commit. You can build in linting and other type of uh, perspective tools that will actually uh, validate and investigate a software package to ensure that it passes all of those security checks and the compliance checks. We're automating that so application developers and end operators can focus on what really matters, and that's mission enablement. So getting a lot of that fluff and actually automating it just streamlines the entire process and allows a code commit to impact the warfighter in days instead of months and months and months. And you know, while the technology is a big part of it, I don't want to lose sight in the slowest portion of the US government, and that's policy and compliance. While we can build it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll fall into the guidelines that you know the policy of 10 years ago had set forth. So we've seen a lot of great changes uh, throughout the IC and DOD, you know, formerly with Nick Shalon, Paul Puckett, and others within the uh, federal community that is really spearheading the opportunity to change compliance from DISA all the way up. And we've seen that not just in the Air Force and the Army, but also the Navy recently with the Black Pearl Initiative under Ken Cato, that's trying to break down the silos from a float to a shore and in flight type of software compliance uh, and make it a single package that can be inherited from and deployed into production quicker than ever. We want to commoditize the experience and really focus on driving value. And that can be done through automation from the infrastructure all the way to the developer. And for the end users, briefly, what would be the, the advantages for them? If we're doing our job, the end users shouldn't care what we're doing because we are focusing on the user experience. Everything from disaster recovery 
to uh, you know health checks to resiliency. None of that should be the end user's uh, problem. They want to focus on being able to use their application and their mission enablement. They will see shorter downtimes, if downtimes at all. We will focus on everything else. It's it's really funny to hear like the Netflix story and hearing the interview process at Netflix, where it's like draw everything that happens between you pressing play on your iPad and a movie coming up. Map everything in the architecture that needs to happen at the end user. That shouldn't matter to me. They should just have a prosperous user experience, and that's what great technology coupled with uh, you know diehard engineers can deliver to the federal government with Kubernetes. So we'll never again see the return of days when you have to send out 10,000 CDs around the world to update software locally and hope for the best. They say everything is cyclical, Tom, but I'm hoping that's not one of those instances. All right. Well, some great thoughts and a lot to think about today. My guest today has been Brandon Gulla, the Chief Technology Officer of Rancher Government Solutions. I'm Tom Temin here on Federal Insights, sponsored by Rancher Government Solutions here on Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, please visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Rancher Government Solutions.